Hi, my name is Nate Hahn. I'm a postdoc in the entomology department at Michigan State University. Um, and this is one of our field sites for the Mowing for Monarchs project or experiment that we're working on. So what we have here is a big patch of milkweed uh, that we found in the spring when they were coming up. We roped it off and you can sort of see it here. It'll be clearer once we do a little mowing in here, but it's basically divided into thirds. So one third of it we're just leaving alone, leaving the milkweed grow. Um, one third of it we mowed down in mid-June and we let the milkweed regenerate because it's a hardy perennial that uh, regrows readily after being knocked down or mowed or anything like that. Um, and then the last third we're going to mow today, so it's the middle of July right now, um, and we'll let it regrow uh, mostly in August. So the idea is the regenerating milkweed stems, monarchs actually prefer to lay eggs on young vegetative plants that haven't begun to flower yet. And typically in a grassland like this, everything's going to flower fairly uniformly and then uh, gradually become less appealing, we think, to monarch butterflies. I'm Lene Jess and I'm the director of the North Central Integrated Pest Management Center, which is based at, in the North Central region at Michigan State University and Iowa State University. So we have co-directors in both places. Pollinators are a big deal because most of the foods, that, especially fruits and vegetables that we eat, are pollinated. Um, by pollinators, so we need to make sure that we have those around so we can keep eating, basically, to put it simply. The reason we included monarchs is they're also found a lot of times in the same habitat, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will soon be making their determination on whether or not monarchs will be an endangered species. So one of the things that we feel we need to look at with researchers is how do we, what's the best habitat for monarchs? How do we keep that habitat healthy for them? If it gets to the point where monarchs are an endangered species, what are growers going to do? It could be, in, in the past, it's been you can't control milkweed. Well, milkweed can be a noxious weed, so, but it's also what the monarchs need. So how can we work with growers, homeowners, environmentalists, anybody, on putting out more habitats for monarchs so we have areas for them to live and that we can keep growing the population? This is kind of a new area that's being looked at, is the mowing. Um, people always thought, oh, don't disturb the milkweed. And so by doing this, they're looking at the research to see if maybe it is better to actually mow them off at certain stages so that the plants are healthier for the monarchs and we won't have as much predation on them. The ants and the spiders and the lady beetles that would eat monarch eggs and caterpillars are basically absent for a little while. So if monarchs want to sw literally swoop in and, uh, and lay uh, eggs on these plants, they might have a better chance of surviving. Early May, I think it was May 19th, uh, Doug actually found the first stock of eggs. He found about 19 and that was enough to start our colony. We've, we've collected a few more eggs since then just to keep adding, but um, yeah, a few eggs goes a long way. So right now we are cleaning our milkweed before it goes into the caterpillar cages. This is to prevent OE, which is a disease that they can, that the caterpillars can get once from milkweed to just get spread around little spores that can attach to them. So we keep it in this bucket, fill it partially with bleach and water just to kill the OE before it goes in. So after it's done, which it's been soaking for 10-15 minutes, we will take it out, shake it out, and then we will rinse it with water so that the bleach doesn't harm the caterpillars. How many stems of milkweed do you think you go through? on a daily basis? So milkweed stems we go through on a daily basis, it really depends on the size of the colony at the time. So right now we have one caterpillar cage. There's probably 10 caterpillars in it and they're very small so we don't need that much. But other times we've had to collect 50 to 80 stems in one day where we have 100 caterpillars, they're fifth instars, they're really hungry and they go through really fast. So then once we get the um, plants out of the cages, we take them and we take pieces of just wet paper towel and fit them to the size of the petri dish. We usually use the, the large ones. And then we'll put, um, we'll just basically deposit the eggs onto there. And I use my fingers, you can use a paintbrush too, but they kind of stick on the bottom a little bit. So I find that I can get a little bit better grip if I just like use my nail and then drop them in. And then usually I'll go in 
after with a paintbrush and kind of organize them into rows. So if we're using this for the colony or for research, we'll put them in chambers to help them incubate and grow. But we'll also then just, once these hatch, we'll put the uh, neonates in another petri dish on some leaves and they'll feed there for a day or two until they um, become the second in stars and then we'll move them into a cage and the whole process kind of starts over. So before there were effective herbicides, in crop fields there would have been um, a lot of mechanical cultivation. So every you know week or something somebody comes through and like rips up the milkweed, which means right. there would have been a lot more phenologic diversity in milkweed. So there always would have been, this is our hypothesis, you know, mm -hmm. maybe we're wrong, but there always would have been a lot of regenerating stems coming up at different times in different parts of crop fields. You know, some would get missed, some would get knocked back every few weeks, so there'd be these newly growing tissues that would have been really uh, appealing to monarchs as they laid eggs.